Arguably, one of the coolest watches to grace this planet. The Amiga Speedmaster has been spoken about time and time again. Everybody from connoisseurs to first-time buyers sing its praises, but the question is, with all of its accomplishments and seals of approval, is it really that good from a design point of view? I'm here to answer that question today, and as always, if you would like your thoughts or topics about watches discussed by a designer, comment them below and I'll write them up. A few weeks ago I did a video about the Rolex Daytona and spent the majority of the time focusing on why its design has changed so much over the last 50 years. In the beginning the watch was purely utilitarian focused, eventually aimed at becoming a cosmograph, a watch for space, and even though they were beaten, the company still brands their dials with the supposed accomplishment like someone who quits their job on the first day, but still puts the experience on their resume. The actual victor was the Omega Speedmaster. So let's cut to the chase. There is nothing cooler than a watch that bears those few words on its case back. Not patent pending, not a scrambled serial number or a military in signature, just the casual flight qualified by NASA for all manned space missions. How badass is that? Oh wait, there's more. The first watch worn on the moon. Now you're just showing off. To begin, let's clarify that this discussion will only be focused on the Speedmaster, not the millions of iterations and limited editions. The bog standard Speedmaster Professional with a manual wind cam wheel movement and acrylic crystal. In the conversation, I'll include some of the notable pieces in the history of the line, but I want the talk to be around this icon. Instead of running through the history like every other discussion, I will focus the talk around the origins of the design, how it changed and then how it remained over time. The model that we ended up seeing in 57, along with the Seamaster, was the first real iteration, and it was never designed for anything but being a sports chronograph, focused towards motor racing and that genre at the time, like so many other brands of watches. So we've seen this watch, and have come to know it thanks to its reissue of the modern overhaul a few years back. And looking at its design, what is not to like? The watch is clean, uncluttered, and very attractive. I think the only piece that sticks out to me as an incongruent element that would sit better on a dive watch is the arrowhead on the hour hand. But otherwise, the watch is so sharp. A key detail that I really enjoy are the intents in between the subdials. And when we get into the later models, I'll elaborate. But what is so amazing about this watch is that its foundation is already there. The people responsible for designing this watch had a vision and followed through. Then the 60s arrived, and we were introduced to the design that would last until the present day. Just let that sink in for a moment. How cool is it to have a design of a watch last this long? The abrupt contract opened up for a watch to be used by the original NASA astronauts, and Omega was in the running with a handful of other competitors. An interesting side note. I always had a thought in the back of my mind that mechanical watches wouldn't work in space. There's no real gravity to help the balance and all the rest of the components, at least I thought, and NASA thought that way too in the time. But really, mechanical watches work as well in space as they do on Earth. Maybe it has to do with their mass. Maybe they are not affected by such change. The only issue is that an automatic rotor wouldn't work, which is why a hand-wound movement was chosen instead and the inertia of the mainspring being the acting force in the closed system would allow for the watch to operate without a problem. Getting back on track, the Speedmaster decimated its competition with its build and Lamania movement, if I'm not mistaken, and managed to withstand every test that was thrown at it, from zero gravity to extreme g-forces to wide ranges of heat and cold variations, drop and pressure tests. Just imagine how awesome the footage of these tests would be. But the watch didn't fail a thing, and it had now arrived on the scene. It had shed its racing pedigree skin, and now was always going to be here to stay. We could almost say that the watch was immortalized from then on, and it saw every space mission that NASA performed at the time, including a handful of walks across the moon. Then it evolved finally into the professional line, when the case was made to allow space for the pushes and crown to recess and sit more comfortably around the watch similar to Rolex and the introduction of the crown guard. 
Then the 3-2-1 movement was introduced into the pieces. And for those of you who don't know, the 3-2-1 movement is widely considered to be one of the best chronograph movements ever made. So imagine owning one of the most iconic watches that now houses one of the greatest calibers. There are a handful of reasons why I believe this watch has become so successful over the decades, but two of them are the most prominent. First, and most importantly, Omega has never lost sight on what made this watch a success in the first place. To this day, they still make them with utility in mind first and as an accessory second. This watch is still marketed as a tool with the same branding and the same forms of advertising. Second, and just as important, the design of the watch may have changed over the years, but the essence of the watch is still the same. These two aspects are the key to cementing an icon in the industry. At least, it's what I've been able to discover over the years of exploring. If you want a successful watch through the ages, treat it the same as you always have and don't change the formula. So we'd think then that the Speedmaster name would suffer just because of how many limited editions of it are released every year. It seems to the layperson that Omega doesn't have a clear vision about the watch, but they do. Because all the while, the Speedmaster professional has, and always be, the Speedmaster, offered at an extremely competitive price, with all of the little nuances that were present on the watch in its heyday. So they have freedom to create whatever they want, like the Ultraman, the Snoopy, and the Speedy Tuesday. It is an excellent business model and keeps the company's creativity up. There is no stagnation because in front of all of these efforts, the Speedmaster Professional remains as Omega's Big Mac. So with that recap and trivia out of the way, let's discuss the watch's design. As you have already seen, there have been a lot of iterations of it in the past. The dial font, the bezel markings, the hands, and many other nuances were changed over the years. But today, unless you are a connoisseur, we can still see that the modern Speedmaster Professional is still heavily influenced by its past. First, let's talk about its size. This watch was big for its day. In contrast, the Daytona settled between 37 and 38 millimeters at the time, where the Speedmaster was 42. How is it possible? Smart engineering. The case is what makes the watch, more specifically the lugs and how they turn in. Because of how well they were integrated, their presence can be reduced in favor of increasing the size of the dial. There is an art form to learn about brushing and polishing on surfaces, and what the Speedmaster manages to do is reduce the watch's visual weight by combining sharp edges, polishing, and brush surfaces correctly. Before we even look at the dial itself, consider the thought that went into the case. As a result, the watch head melds into the bracelet very smoothly. And the bracelet is a staple in Omega's lineup nowadays. I've said that Omega's bracelets shook Rolex into action at the turn of the millennium, and the advent of their milled clasps changed the landscape. The construction is bulletproof and distinctly their own, with more of a focus on brushing across the surface. On to the most prominent element, the dial. The million dollar question is why does it work so well? Why is it that after staring at it for a few seconds, everything seems clear, when before it might have looked cluttered? You see, generally a flat color like black is difficult to break up, which is why so many watches, even to this day, tend to use contrasting dials and subdials, just to separate themselves, making them easily discernible. This method, after looking at what the Speedmaster is capable of doing, shows just how far ahead the team was who created it. This dial has a visual language all to itself, and it has to do with the power of the white line. I can already tell, just by breaking up all of the individual elements, that the process and development that went into making this dial was far greater than we can imagine. I would venture so far to say that this dial might have been one of the most revised and tested layouts in modern watchmaking. The placement of every line is so precise, and the use of negative space is also very refreshing. I can say from first-hand experience that this is what designers strive for, harmony with as little as possible. And this was done just by adjusting the boldness of white lines, making them stand out more than others. Genius. And what we get is a result that is clean, easy on the eyes, and legible from any distance. Notice also that the dial has eliminated all polished surfaces on its face. The hands, most notably, are also white, and are congruent with the hour plots, being almost the same thickness. Also notice that none of the elements, like the hands and indices, have stainless steel surrounds. That means from any angle this watch can be read without the need to adjust the wrist. There is no glare. 
Then the aluminium tachymeter, though a pretty redundant bezel for space travel, ties the watch together with the same choice of colour scheme. The more I look at it, the more I want to say that this watch is such a beautiful instrument. Even if you hate the brand and hate the watch, you cannot deny what this product has been capable of achieving. Some of the individual elements that I like particularly is how the crown has been cleverly placed within the case, something that more brands should consider. Referring back to the subdials again, they are the only parts of the face that have any semblance of depth since they have been recessed downwards. And I think the idea of indenting the dial for the sake of presence is so much more effective than simply changing its color. The hands are another interesting talking point because they are so accurate. Notice how the minute hand touches the indices with such precision and the same with the needle shaped chronograph seconds hand. So much attention has been put into these small details that many wouldn't even notice. Now onto criticisms. The only element I don't like about the watch is the bracelet. More specifically the end links and how they sit proud of the case. I say this about a lot of watches so it's a general nitpick. Call me old fashioned but I think the idea of hollow end links are so much more flattering for this watch. Because the face has such a wide diameter the hollow end links would help reduce its presence on the wrist and also harken back to the watch's origins. But again this is merely a nitpick and a very small one. Looking at how a product has transcended time the Speedmaster is the kind of watch you would expect to see in a film like 2001 A Space Odyssey. But then it could be seen again 100 years, maybe even a thousand years in the future. And with all that said and done, this watch really deserved to be in space. To be called the Space Watch. To be designed for that purpose and to go where very few have ever gone. It just is one of those pieces that has managed to become an icon of design, not through hype, rampant journalism, opinions or marketing, but as a matter of fact. Along with the likes of the Empire State Building and the iPhone, the Omega Speedmaster Professional has a dedicated section as a notable industrial design marvel of the 20th century, and is even discussed by people who know nothing about watches. So in my mind, this watch has transcended the banal products of the past six decades, and has established itself as something truly great that will prevail longer than any of us for millennia to come.